So, we seem to all agree that anti-Semitism is bad. Of course, educated, knowledgeable people are unlikely to be seduced by it because we know where it leads. Nazism, Auschwitz, and the gas chambers. But anti-Zionism does not appear to be in the same category. It appears to be good. We heard here that it is about supporting Palestinians, about fighting for human rights. Educated, knowledgeable, well-meaning people might support it. But the anti-Semitism we all acknowledge as bad, when it started, looked nothing like where it led. In fact, when you compare the beginnings of anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism, the similarities are striking. Anti-Semitism began by creating a new collective designation for the same people which rendered them different. In secular 19th century Europe, it was no longer Jews, but Semites. And it never was intended to meet anything but Jews. In the Soviet Union, who claimed to not notice different religions and peoples, Jews were designated as Zionists. And today, in the West, in the UK, Zionists, Zios. The designation is then described as having essential, immutable, loathsome qualities. In Christian Europe, we were Christ killers. To the Nazis, we were an impure race. To the Soviets, we were capitalists and imperialists. And today, the state of Israel is the ultimate violator of human rights. It is described as born in sin. It is guilty by its very nature of the crimes of racism, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, Nazism, genocide. The designation of the group and ascribing of essential evil qualities is always given the aura of rationality and respectability by relying on the greatest source of authority of a given era, religion in pre-modern times, science in the modern era, human rights in our own. The aura of the greatest authority is necessary because the collective transformation of the Jews into a loathsome other requires that one be willing to twist reality, if not outright ignore it. It is only by appealing to the authority of religious doctrine that all Jews living in the 12th century could be collectively designated as the killers of Christ over a thousand years earlier. It is only by appealing to the authority of a perverted science that the very Jews who contributed to European society could suddenly be considered as endangering its racial purity. And it is only by appealing to a perverted version of human rights that Zionism in Israel could be designated as its greatest violators. It is only by perverting the idea of human rights that those who were actually ethnically cleansed from every part of the Arab world could be accused of ethnic cleansing. It is only through the sort of perversion that the people who repeatedly said yes to partitioning the land into a Jewish state and a Palestinian state could be described as those who stand in the way of a two-state solution. And it is only through this perversion that in an age when the idea of the nation is still tied for almost all states to the idea of a common history, language, ethnicity, and remnants of religion, Israel is singled out as uniquely deviant. But why go to all that effort to single out a group and distort reality? Because we humans have a primal need for scapegoats. And for whatever reason, my people have been the designated scapegoats for so many and for so long. For medieval Christianity, we stood between a brutish and nasty world and salvation. For Germany, for Europe, we stood between them and glory. For Stalin, we stood in the way of communist utopia. 
and today? Why bother fighting colonialism in its aftermath? Easier to designate Zionists as colonialists and blame them. Why do the hard work of fighting racism in its many manifestations across all societies? Easier to designate Zionism as racism and apartheid and blame it. Why acknowledge the tremendous difficulties of living up to the ideals of human rights? Designate Zionism in Israel as its greatest violators and blame them. But the problem with human scapegoats is that unlike ancient animal ones, humans might resist their sacrifice a bit more. And we can't have that happen, can we? So action must be taken to reduce their resistance. How? Strip them of their defenses. Push them to the margins. Step by step, take away that which protects them. But it must be done gradually. Anti-Semitism did not start by stripping Jews of their citizenship, confiscating their assets, and pushing them into ghettos. It started by slowly pushing Jews out of the positions they were able to attain after several decades of European emancipation. It operated by making it more and more difficult for Jews to feel comfortable in European society. Anti-Semitism also lured Jews into dropping their defenses, preventing them from organizing against the coming danger, telling them that if they were the good kind of Jew, for example, in Germany, those who fought for Germany in World War I, they would be spared. They were not. Note how anti-Zionism operates now. Its main targets are the two places where Jews have organized most effectively for their defense, the State of Israel and the pro-Israel lobby in the US. The legitimacy of both is relentlessly and uniquely questioned. Jews, now designated as Zionists, are increasingly pushed out of certain spaces. Jewish students in the US are slowly pulling out of universities, known for their virulent anti-Zionism. Liberal activist Jews are finding they are increasingly unwelcome in progressive circles. Jews here in Britain are finding they can no longer be in the Labour Party, their traditional political home, wondering if they might one day have to leave the country altogether. Anti-Zionism also lures Jews to give up their defenses. We heard it here. Why don't we all live together in a single state? Yes, we know that nowhere in the Arab world have Jews ever been treated as equals and were violently ethnically cleansed when their dared raise their heads. Yes, we know that by national states, certainly in this region, but not only, descend into bloody mayhem. But we assure you, this one will work. Just forgo your insistence on having your own state where you control your defense. Anti-Zionists also insist on their respectability. They will try to convince you that the fact that the targets of this new form of virulent hatred bear a striking resemblance to those who were targets in previous times is sheer coincidence. They will insist that the fact that the charges against this group appear like variations on the ancient themes of anti-Semitism is sheer coincidence. They might even convince you they are fighting anti-Semitism, but the old, easy-to-identify kind, which we already know is bad. And this is where it all comes together. In the past, waves of Jew hatred and anti-Semitism did not arise from something that those who were hated actually did. It arose from a crisis in the society of those doing the hating. And in an age of crisis, especially a crisis of identity, when we're no longer sure who we are, what we stand for, we desperately need certainties. And there are few greater certainties in this world than that the Jews did it. And so the Zionists are designated as a collective group, which happens to coincide with the group previously known as Semites and Jews. 
They are then ascribed the most loathsome qualities of our time by appealing to the great authority of our era, and then they are slowly subject to a process designed to strip them of the means of resisting their ultimate role as scapegoat for the crisis of the era. And when that process would be complete, the scapegoat could finally be sacrificed in the vain hope that in doing so, a better world would emerge. It never does. And this is why the topic of this debate is not just another topic. It raises the very specter that we might be a society on the precipice, which is why we are here today, in the hope that some of you will see the deep insidious undercurrents, so that this time we will not have to wait to see where anti-Zionism leads, and only then look back in hindsight and say, ah, yes, that rising wave of anti-Zionism was indeed the new form of anti-Semitism.